Well, thank you very much, John, for the introduction, and thank you for the great work that you and the U.S.-China Business Council do day in and day out to foster this very important relationship. I do want to acknowledge uh, Jim Sasser uh, in the audience here, uh, former ambassador, U.S. ambassador to China. Uh, he ought to be really up here talking, uh, really from his vantage point of his years of service uh, in the United States Congress, uh, the United States Senate, excuse me, and then also uh, from his years of serving in China. Uh, but uh, Ambassador, please stand up so that we can recognize you as well for your great <laughs> service to this country and the U.S.-China relationship. Uh, we are here today, uh, less than a week away from a very important state visit by President Hu Jintao. And more than two decades ago, on my first trip to mainland China, I could not imagine that the U.S.-China relationship would eventually become so consequential. Nor could I have imagined a scene uh, that, like we witnessed just a few days ago, uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense Gates joining together with his Chinese counterpart to stress the need for stronger military ties between China and the United States. In 1989, on that first trip to China, I came in from Shanghai's airport on a rickety Russian-made bus and stepped into that city's dimly lit streets into a world vastly different from the one I left in the United States. The streets were swarming with bicycles at 10 p.m. Young men with their dates riding on the handlebars, grandparents pedaling to the market, boys and girls with white knuckle grips on their parents' shoulders, bikes everywhere, bikes everywhere. And Shanghai then was a very gritty industrial city filled with nothing but low-rise buildings. There were no skyscrapers and very few automobiles. There was little sign of what was to come. Today, Shanghai's skyline is dotted with more than 400 skyscrapers. And if you go to the Shanghai World Financial Center, one of the tallest buildings in the world, you can actually stay at the Park Hyatt Hotel with a lobby on the 79th floor. And those bikes that I saw on my very first visit have been replaced by cars, Elevated freeways, maglev uh, trains, shuttling people and commerce at a very frenetic pace. To see it is to be awed. And I am every time I visit China. The explosive growth in places like Shanghai have helped lift almost 200 million people out of poverty. And in the years ahead, hundreds of millions more Chinese will join the middle class. The United States welcomes this growth because it's good for the people of China. It's good for the global economy. And it's good for U.S. companies who offer world-class products and services, products and services that can improve the quality of life and the standard of living for the people of China while providing jobs for Americans back here at home. With the U.S.-China Business Council's help, this has become perhaps the most important bilateral trading relationship. And China is the top destination for American exports behind just Canada and Mexico. And America is the number one nation market for Chinese exports. And indeed, last year, exports to China from America were up 34% compared to 2009. And indeed, U.S. exports are on track to exceed $100 billion in 2011. In the past 20 years, U.S. exports to China have increased by a factor of 12. Imports from China to the United States have increased by more than 30-fold. But we are at a turning point in the U.S.-China economic partnership. The policies and practices that have shaped our relations over the past few decades will not suffice to overcome the economic challenges facing the United States, China, and indeed the global community. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about how we can move forward and unlock the full potential of the U.S.-China commercial relationship in the early 21st century. The gross trade imbalances between our countries are a good place to start because they threaten global stability and prosperity. I think a great illustration of that can be found in, of all places, Trenton, New Jersey. Many of you have likely taken Amtrak up to New York, and when you pass by the Delaware River in New Jersey, you see that famous sign, Trenton makes 
and the world takes. Well, replace Trenton with China, and you have a simplistic but pretty accurate description of the global economy over the last few decades. China and the United States benefited tremendously from this arrangement uh, in recent years. American consumers got an impressive array of low-cost goods. And in its transition into one of the world's top exporters, China was able to lift millions of its citizens into a fast-growing middle class. But that's not sustainable anymore. The debt-fueled consumption binge in developed countries like America must end. And countries like China are beginning to realize that there are limits and drawbacks to purely export-driven growth. That's why we need a more equitable commercial relationship. And it's within our reach. The United States is doing its part to facilitate global adjustments by increasing private savings and exports, as well as taking steps to bring down its long-term fiscal deficits to a sustainable level. And the Chinese leadership is making the rebalancing of its economy one of the cornerstones of its forthcoming five-year plan. China is aiming to promote domestic consumption through a variety of measures, such as boosting the minimum wage for its workers and building an improved social safety net. Changes like these will hasten the rise of a middle class that wants the same cars, appliances, fashion, medical care, and other amenities that have long been enjoyed by consumers in the Western world. The Chinese government is also putting an intensive focus on strategic emerging industries with more high-value work in areas like healthcare, energy, and high technology. And the Chinese have signaled that they want foreign businesses to help develop these sectors by entering into joint ventures and by conducting more research and development in China. This is assistance that U.S. companies are eager to provide so long as China deals meaningfully with concerns about intellectual property protection, as well as a variety of other issues that I'll touch upon later. Such cooperative projects can serve as the foundation for a stronger economic relationship between China and the U.S. But China's success at addressing the concerns of international businesses, including those in the U.S., will help determine whether it realizes its economic vision, a vision in which China is a leader in innovation and a producer of higher value goods and services. And now here's the good news. We're already seeing examples of just how this future could play out with our businesses and governments collaborating to tackle some of the world's greatest challenges. Just look at what's happening with the new energy cooperation program that US uh, Energy, uh, U.S. Secretary of Energy Steve Chu and I announced in China in 2009, October 2009, to promote more collaboration between Chinese and American companies on energy issues. One of the founding corporate members of the program, Boeing, is partnering with Air China and Petro China to research a new generation of aviation biofuels that don't rely on food crops. If this venture is successful, it could reduce the carbon footprint of airplane travel, but also avoid the negative impacts that other biofuels have on our global food supply. Or look at what's happening with Duke Energy, one of America's leading utilities, which has signed an agreement for joint research with China's largest energy company, Wanung, and with the Chinese government's Thermal Power Research Institute. Today, there are scientists and researchers shuttling between the companies and the research institute, working to develop cutting-edge solutions for cleaner burning coal and carbon sequestration. The Chinese and American governments are also working together on a variety of transportation issues, including how to spur the development of more high-speed rail in America. China has embraced high-speed rail and has, and has developed its infrastructure at a tremendous rate. Starting from scratch, China has constructed and put into service over 4,000 miles of high-speed routes in just the last 10 years, making China the longest high-speed rail network in the world. In meetings last year, officials and experts from the Department of Transportation and China's Railway Ministry met in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Massachusetts to share information on the development of high-speed rail standards. And the Chinese government has signed cooperation agreements 
with the state of California on California's high-speed rail project to link Anaheim and San Francisco. There is, however, a sobering side to U.S.-China commercial relations. For every story like Duke Energy's or Boeing's, there are many more that are never written. And when I talk to business leaders across America, they continue to express significant concerns shared by businesses all around the world about the commercial environment in China, especially China's lax intellectual property protection and enforcement, lack of transparency in government decision making, and numerous innovation, innovation and numerous indigenous innovation policies that work to preclude um, foreign companies for vying for Chinese government contracts, because these policies mandate that products must be made, conceived, and designed in China. It's important to note that since China formally joined the WTO nine years ago, it has made important progress opening its markets. Tariffs have come down. Property rights are steadily evolving. And great strides have, made, have been made to free the flow of commerce across China's borders. On balance, the competitive playing field in China is fair to foreign firms. And we commend the Chinese for that progress over the last 10 years. And it's also not lost on countries in the West that on our march toward industrialization, we sometimes protected native industries with policies that today would mobilize an army of WTO lawyers in opposition. Those policies were folly then, and they are surely folly now. After World War II, the United States and a growing community of nations painstakingly built a global trading system based on freer flow of goods, ideas, and services across borders. And the creation of the World Trade Organization in 1995 ensured that countries would be held accountable for their commitments to open markets and lower barriers. China has benefited tremendously from this international trading system, especially since it joined the WTO in 2001. Thus, the United States and other foreign nations have every right to seek more meaningful commitment and progress from China in implementing the market opening policies that China agreed to when it joined the WTO. From our experience, there are usually five things that need to happen to turn promises into reality. It starts with the easiest step, a statement of principle from Chinese officials that action will be taken to solve a market access issue. Next, that agreement has to be codified into binding law or regulations. Third, the law or regulation needs to be faithfully implemented at the central government level. And fourth, it needs to be implemented at the local and provincial levels. Only after all of these things have happened can you arrive at the fifth, final, and most important step, which is where the new law or regulation becomes a norm, an accepted way of doing business in China's commercial culture. When it comes to indigenous innovation, intellectual property, or a variety of other market access issues, an enduring frustration is that in too many cases, only the earlier steps are taken but not all five. Perhaps an agreement is made, but it's never made binding. Or perhaps there's a well-written law or regulation at the national level, but there's lax enforcement at the provincial or local level. A few weeks ago, the Commerce Department and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative welcomed Vice Premier Wang Shishan and other leading Chinese officials for the 21st Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade where we actually work through a variety of very specific trade issues. It produced a commitment from the Chinese to technology neutrality uh, for future telecommunication standards so that the market decides what succeeds. Vice Premier Wang and his team were also responsive to our concerns and they pledged action in a variety of areas critical to American businesses. They agreed to remove administrative and regulatory barriers discriminating against American companies selling everything from industrial machinery to telecom devices. They also removed restrictions on U.S. participation in the development of large-scale wind farms in China. They also agreed to revise some of their major government procurement catalogs to 
to ensure a level playing field for foreign suppliers and to reduce the use of counterfeit software in government offices and state-owned enterprises. Additionally, Vice Premier Wong asked the Commerce Department and the U.S. Trade Representative's Office to partner with him on a public campaign to reduce intellectual property rights violations in China, an effort that he is leading. The American government welcomes these commitments from China. But to be clear, they are only a first step. And what was agreed to at the JCCT were important statements of principle and policy, but they must now be turned into concrete action with results. Take last year's JCCT, when the Chinese agreed to remove a local content requirement for wind turbine suppliers, a very positive step forward. But soon after, China's government employed a rule that required foreign businesses seeking to build large-scale wind farms in China to have prior experience in China. The rule might have been different than the local content requirement, but it had the same effect, making it tougher for foreign companies to compete with China's domestic companies. At this year's JCCT, we persuaded the Chinese to remove that rule as well. Or look at the issue of intellectual property. We've heard Chinese leaders condemn IP theft in the strongest terms, and we've seen central government laws and regulations written or amended to reflect that sentiment. But American and other foreign companies in industries ranging from pharmaceuticals and biotechnology to entertainment still lose billions of dollars from counterfeiting and IP theft in China every single year. For example, in the United States, for every $1 in computer hardware sales, there is about 88 cents in software sales. But in China, for every $1 in hardware sales, there's only 8 cents in software sales. According to the Business Software Alliance, that discrepancy is largely explained by the fact that nearly 80% of the software used on computers in China is counterfeit. So America welcomes Vice, Premier's, uh, Vice Premier Wong's pledge to accelerate China's crackdown on intellectual property violations. And China will have a willing partner in this endeavor in the United States. But we will be focused on meaningful outcomes. I recognize that I'm not the first foreign official to express concern over the commercial environment in China. But it would be a mistake to portray this concern solely as U.S. self-interest masquerading as advice. The Chinese economy is increasingly moving up the global economic value chain, where growth is created not just by the power of a country's industrial might, but also by the power of its people's ideas and their inventions. In the long run, economies with poor intellectual property rights protections and inconsistent application of market access laws will lose out on generating great ideas and technologies. And they'll lose out on the jobs that come with producing new products, jobs critical to an expanding middle class. The damage won't happen overnight. I freely admit that companies and countries can gain short-term advantages from, rack, from lax rules in the commercial space. But over time, if innovators fear that their inventions or ideas will be stolen or discriminated against, one of two things will happen. They'll either stop inventing or they'll decide to create or sell their inventions elsewhere. Ultimately, all that the United States seeks is a level playing field for its companies, where the cost and quality of their products determines whether or not they win business. That is the ideal that we strive for in the United States. And our commitment to open and competitive markets is a big reason why we remain the number one destination for foreign direct investment in the world. We understand that China's modernization and evolution toward a more market-oriented economy is a process that will take time. China has 1.3 billion people. 700 million of them still live in rural areas, many with little electricity or running water. It took the United States over 100 years to build the electrical transmission capacity that it has today. And to meet the rising demands of its own consumers, China will have to build a similar amount of capacity in just 15 years. 
These are enormous undertakings. And it's understandable if, in the past, China's immediate development goals took precedent over other concerns. With millions of Chinese coming in from the countryside looking for work, it isn't necessarily an easy decision to close down a factory producing counterfeit goods when that factory is providing badly needed jobs. So what we're discussing here are real and significant challenges. But for market reforms to continue, it will take constant vigilance, not just from the United States, but from all countries and business, uh, businesses around the world that benefit from rules-based trading. It will also require vigilance from Chinese business and government leaders who themselves have a strong stake in ensuring that China is friendly to global innovation and international competition. In front of us is the opportunity for China and the United States to lead the world and its economy in the early 21st century, to create a new foundation for sustainable growth for years to come. We can't tell exactly what that future will look like, but we can be certain that it will be a better future if China and the United States government pursue cooperation over confrontation in the economic sphere. Cooperation that will put millions of our people, both of our peoples, to work. Cooperation that will develop technologies to solve the most pressing environmental, economic, and social challenges facing the world today. This is the great opportunity before the United States and China. We simply have to seize it. Thank you very much. Thank you.